This man has a long way to go. Whether he makes it depends entirely on his own stamina and determination. For he's free to quit at any time. Already he is cruelly punishing his body. His feet are throbbing and blistered, his ankles swelling. His shoulder muscles are aching from the heavily laden burden he carries on his back. His immediate objective is still some 25 kilometers away. But that's only for today. Tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after that, he will force himself further, meeting the harsher ordeals expected. He'll be tested to the utmost limits of his endurance, and possibly beyond. The schedule is as arduous as that of any aspiring Olympic athlete. But this man is competing only against himself. He wants to prove that he possesses a specific and very rare blend of exceptional physical and mental qualities. By doing so, he'll take the first step towards realizing what is a dominating, all-consuming ambition. His goal, eventually, is to gain admission to the ranks of the most revered military unit to serve in the ranks of what are most commonly referred to as special forces. Throughout the armies of the world, there has emerged a new breed of courageous men. Men willing to risk and lay down their lives, often in perilous covert missions deep behind enemy lines. Highly trained and obsessively focused, they are the crack troops of the world's elite special forces. Since World War II, this new breed of elite soldiers has emerged. No longer ad hoc groups mounting hit-and-run raids on enemy targets, but a highly organized, highly trained, intensely self-disciplined and ruthless band of men who make up the individual elite forces of the world's armies. The SAS, USA's Delta Force, Germany's GSG-9, the French Foreign Legion, Russia's Spetsnaz, and the US Navy SEALs are just a few of the many special forces units. All have a grueling and exacting selection process. Only the truly elite make the grade. Once selected, they undergo an intense and physically demanding training process to an impossibly high standard, finally going on to become highly trained fighting machines with the emphasis on stamina, mental focus, and imagination. But above all, the will to survive, making them the true Ultimate Warriors. Hello, my name's Andy McNabb. I served in the British Army for 18 years. Ten of those years were with 22 SAS, the Special Air Service. And what I want to do during this, this programme is to relate some of my experiences with you. The first thing I want to say is that nobody gets into any Special Forces unless they give 100%. That's both physically and mentally. Because once you get in, there's no excuse for anything else. Because what they'll demand from you always is 100%. To get into the Special Air Service, or what we call a regiment, takes a high degree of stamina. Now that's both physical and mental. But it doesn't stop there, because once you get into your squadron, that fitness has to be maintained. And there's no fitness test once you're there. It's all down to self-discipline. But the day you can't fulfill your task, because you're not fit enough, then that's time to leave. And even at this early stage in my selection, I felt this uh, affinity to special forces and felt part of the family. But still, I had six months to go. A number of countries maintain special forces units. The variations make a compact definition impossible, but they all have some common features. Invariably, the units are manned by volunteers only. Entry into these elite forces is exacting and difficult. The training is specialized, intensive, and wide-ranging. The units are small and prefer a high degree of anonymity, as the work is often covert and decided at the highest government level. Sometimes, inevitably, 
particular operations attract world headlines, but for the individual soldiers, only a strict, anonymous fame is tolerated, since neither their true names or their identity can be made public. The pay is not extravagant, the time spent away from friends and loved ones invariably long. Anyone joining special forces can expect neither wealth nor glory. Theirs is a different motivation, one of self-belief. How far they can push their own limits, with the inner satisfaction of belonging to a small group of highly skilled and motivated professionals with the chance of carrying out tasks few would even venture to undertake. Special forces can be traced back even to Roman times, but they only started to appear as we know it during the Second World War. And this was partly due to new military technology, and in particular, aviation because it was now possible to get small groups of men, transport them over into enemy territory to create havoc and bring them back again. So what was needed was men capable of doing that, taking advantage of this technology, because the whole concept of special forces is to create the maximum damage with a minimum risk. Burma, 1943. The Chindits, brainchild of the eccentric but charismatic Ord Windgate, mounted their first daring raid into occupied Burma, providing a desperately needed gleam of success in a theater hitherto dogged by defeat. The Chindits blossomed under the joint sponsorship of Churchill and the Americans into a core-sized special forces unit. North Africa, 1942. A detachment of David Sterling's newly formed SAS, the Special Air Service, sets out across the desert on a daring raid which takes them hundreds of miles deep behind enemy lines. In under two years, Sterling's men will destroy hundreds of fuel dumps, vehicles, and some 300 Luftwaffe aircraft, the equivalent of a modest air force. The Pacific, 1942. Responding to a radioed warning from an Australian coast watcher living undercover amidst the enemy, American naval aircraft repel a major Japanese strike against the fragile yet vital bridgehead on Guadalcanal. Gran Sasso, Italy, 1943. In a spectacular rescue mission, a German unit led by Otto Scorzeni snatches the captive Mussolini from his mountaintop prison. Malaya, 1951. An SAS troop treks into the jungle for a week-long reconnaissance mission. Such missions are crucial to what will prove to be one of the most successful counterinsurgency wars ever mounted. Vietnam, 1964. U.S. Green Berets, living and working with the native Vietnamese, encourage and train the villagers to defend themselves against the Viet Cong. This Hearts and Minds campaign achieves outstanding success, but is cancelled before coming to full fruition. Uganda, 1976. After an airliner flying from Tel Aviv is hijacked and forced to land at Entebbe Airport, the paratroopers of Israel's Special Unit 269 are mobilized. In an audacious surprise assault, they seize the airport and safely rescue all but three of the 258 hostages. The Falklands, 1982. As the British prepare for the recapture of the Argentinian-occupied islands, both the SAS and the SBS are already ashore on both the Falkland Islands and mainland Argentina, transmitting back invaluable information about the Argentinian strength and positions. The Gulf War, 1991. Allied aircraft take off on a mission to destroy a group of 29 Iraqi Scud missiles. The elusive and easily transportable Scuds have been located and pinpointed by a joint group of the British and US Special Forces units. You've seen a little of what special forces have achieved in the past. In the rest of the program, we're going to explore what goes in the making of today's special forces soldier. We'll see how the recruitment and selection process works and what the initial training involves. But above all, we'll be asking what makes a special forces soldier? What motivates him? Why does he risk his life? Because at the end of the day, special forces will always be involved in a conflict. Therefore, the risk of him losing his life is far greater. What motivates him to do that? If you pass selection and become a special forces soldier, there's a wide range of skills that you'll then be expected to master. And these fall into two groups, an infiltration skill and a patrol skill. 
Infiltration skills are there so that you can covertly make entry into enemy territory, whatever the terrain. This could be by parachute, by sea, or by land. Then once you're there, you'll start to employ patrol skills. And these could be things like a demolitions expert, uh, a signaller, uh, a medic, or even a linguist, so you at least you can speak the language of the territory you're operating in. A member of a special forces unit will be expected to learn and master all aspects of parachuting, from static line, where the chute is automatically deployed on exit from the aircraft, to the highly specialized halo and hey-ho parachuting. The technique of hey-ho, high altitude, high opening parachuting, allows the special forces soldier to exit the aircraft in unoccupied territory and drift deep behind enemy lines. These parachutists may take as long as an hour to fall to earth. During that time, they will travel and maneuver up to 80 kilometers, carrying a full ground operations kit and weapon with the combined weight of the complete kit in excess of 100 pounds. But they'll land within a few dozen yards to the setup landing beacon. Halo, high altitude, low opening parachuting, allows the special forces unit to land in close formation, hitting the ground running, ready for operations. Sometimes they will free fall low into valleys before opening. If there is a water crossing involved in assaulting or wrecking an objective, approach by canoe or inflatable is often used. Approach by water may be easier and more covert than an assault by land, allowing the special forces unit to silently approach their target. Units are trained and equipped to deal with all kinds of terrain, climates and conditions from the vast frozen wastes of the Arctic to the sweltering heat of the jungle. Special forces must be equipped and ready for any eventuality. When men are likely to be living for long periods in harsh and inhospitable environments, they must be prepared for illness or accident, from an animal or insect bite to gunshot wounds and bomb blasts. Dealing with volatile hostage situations has become one of the mainstays of the modern special forces. Their hostage, assault and rescue skills are practiced and honed in the killing house. Adopted by many of the world's special forces, the killing house is a warren of concrete rooms devised by the SAS and designed to simulate the combat environment of hostage and rescue situations. There are many trouble spots in the world where winning the trust of local people is as important as any military operation and can often help in achieving objectives. A knowledge of the local language is vital, allowing the special forces unit to adopt a hearts and minds policy, winning the friendship and cooperation of the local people. You notice we haven't been talking about shooting people or blowing things up. Yes, that does happen. Sometimes that is your job. Sometimes you're put in a situation, and the only way out of it is to do that. But if you look at the terrorist situations that the regiment gets involved with throughout the world, arrests outweigh the number of kills that the regiment have taken. That's purely because if you're in a situation to kill somebody, they're normally in a situation to kill you also. And that's what you don't want. You want the maximum gain and the minimum risk. What special forces don't want are the gun-ho Rambo-type characters. Anybody coming on selection thinking that they're going to be James Bond afterwards are soon weeded out. What they do require, though, is a person with level-headed intelligence. There's lots of new information and lots of new skills that you've got to take in and understand and then be able to use them under extreme pressure. You've also got to be able to think, work and make decisions without any direct command because what Special Forces is all about is working in covert situations. So you've got to be able to use this. Details apart, the process for admission to most special forces units follows roughly the same pattern, beginning with a grueling period of physical training, followed by an intense period of military training to an impossibly high standard. These must be a truly elite band of special men, a breed apart, the ultimate warriors. Like all special forces, the SAS receive many applicants. With selection held only twice a year, they may have as many as 180 men on each intake. 
Less than a handful will even make it through the first month. Sometimes, none will. There is fierce competition to serve in the Legion's two rep, the elite parachute division, the most famous of the Legion's nine regiments. The second rep is one of the crack fast reaction units of the French army and one of the most formidable fighting regiments of the world. The US Navy SEALs only take the brightest and the best from the regular Navy and put them through an awesome training regime whilst drilling in their ethic to infiltrate the heart of hostile forces whilst clearing the way for larger armed units. The first step of getting into special forces is wanting to. Wanting to more than anything else. Anyone at all serious about making the grade will find out all that he can and what he might face during selection and prepare for it. He will know that the bulk of special forces selection will comprise of increasingly grueling tests of endurance and stamina, route marches, obstacle courses, and fitness tests. A prospective candidate will train for it and will have to train relentlessly. I basically trained every spare minute I could and passing selection become a total obsession and there was nothing else that mattered. I even spent Christmas Day up on the Brecon Beacons getting some hill work in before I went for my winter selection. And every morning when I had a shave, I'd written on the mirror, RGJ no, and that was my old unit, regiment yes. Much of special forces selection is designed to mirror the contingency of actual warfare. In a combat situation, no one can predict the unpredictability of war. Accordingly, on selection, the men are sent from checkpoint to checkpoint, not knowing when the final leg may be. At times, they're told they have finished, only to be sent out again, designed to break their spirit. Many of the candidates arriving on special forces selection will try to gain some physical advantage by subsidizing their diet with electrolytic drinks and multivitamins. But the old hands will tell you, a plate of stodgy meat and potatoes is just as effective. I just basically drank loads of Lucasade and all those electrolyte type drinks. Uh, the biggest tip I was given that really works was getting as much breakfast as possible all the fry-ups, the toasts, the cereals, everything. There were some people who really didn't like that, you know, sort of four or five o'clock in the morning. But if you don't fill up on stodge earlier on, you're not gonna make it. That's the first and last hot meal you're gonna get until you get back in at the end of that tab. Okay, fellas, what's gonna happen in the next 10 minutes? You're gonna go around the other side of the vehicle Take your Bergens off, sit yourselves down, and just relax. Only in the UK's SAS do they concentrate on individual route marches between preset checkpoints. The men are given only a grid reference and must tab or march alone, carrying increasingly heavier loads across the inhospitable and dangerous terrain of the Welsh mountains. One, one, zero. Your route, low. Right, no way going. Yeah, it shows. Stopping regularly to read the map only adds up to a lot of wasted time, so map reading needs to be done on the move. Apart from regular training, members of Spetsnaz spend an additional three months completing specialized training in such diverse skills as urban fighting, with extreme emphasis put on agility and stamina. During SAS selection, the first big benchmark test comes within the first week, the fan dance. The name comes from the awesome steep ridge in the Brecon Beacons called the Penny Fan. On the fan dance, the men run in pairs with the instructors, whose only advice is, if you don't keep up with us, you're late. All members of the Green Berets Special Forces Group are volunteers who must be parachute qualified and undergo a rigorous training program lasting between 44 and 62 weeks. The selection process is as demanding as any of the world's Special Forces units. During SAS selection, the men will ascend and descend a steep ridge of the Penny Fan, some 3,000 feet high, in the course of a punishing 26-kilometer run, 
again loaded with their nine and a half pound weapon and the 35 pound Bergen and allowed only four and a half hours to complete the task. Selection is held only twice a year, once in winter and once in summer. Not even the severest extreme weather will prevent selection being held. The men are set off in rain, snow, fog, or extreme heat. The tab is punishing and not for the faint-hearted. In the depths of winter, there have been many fatalities, often tabbing through driving rain and 100 mile an hour winds. Men have been picked up and blown clean off the top of the fab. In summer, the tab is equally grueling, with the extremity of the steep climb draining even the fittest with dehydration and heat exhaustion. Many fail this first big task, designed to weed out the weak and the unfit. After the fan darts, with three weeks still to go, around two-thirds of the original intake remain. The distances of the tabs now go as high as 63 kilometers, and they begin to include night marches. In the US Navy SEALs, training concentrates on practical techniques and teamwork and how to work together. The men carry telegraph poles and dinghies to further develop their sense of cooperation and reliance on each other. At the end of their first phase of training, the candidates can run four miles in under 30 minutes and swim two miles in under 90 minutes. The one thing I did start to pick up during selection uh, was the slang. Words like buck she, basher, bone, head shape, okay, um, green slime. At first, these, these were very, very uh, confusing, and I just used to nod and agree and, and try and find out what they were later on. But certainly, once I got into my squadron, um, it became an uh, everyday part of my language. But there is good reason for the fierce training regime of the world's special forces. These men may be called upon to face the real ferocity of battle, to be able to function, react and operate in the heat and confusion of bloody conflict, where the objective and lives of their comrades will rely on the individuality and tenacity of the ultimate warrior. As history has recorded, in all theatres of war, the world's special forces have always played a crucial role. Well done, mate. Keep it going. That's good. That's good. Every morning there is a fresh pain barrier to be breached. The men start off stiff and cramped from their exertions, taking a ferociously punishing 10 minutes before the sweat begins to flow and their bodies begin to recover their rhythm. And they're still not told what to expect for that day's taps. During SAS selection, there are pitfalls for the unwary or unalert. Number 155 stop route. Green, 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 okay. Take your bergen off. What weight should your bergen be? 60 pounds, stuff. Those who think it's clever to lighten the load from their bergen will quickly have a heavy stone added and will probably face being RTU'd once the day is over. Right, you're 15 pounds under. Sorry, stuff. Okay, you see the rock there? Stop. Get it inside your bergen. Your name's been taken. And it'll be reported to the training major when we get back. And he'll probably have a word with you. I'll also radio through to the other DS, to the other checkpoints. And they'll check to see if that rock's still in there. So don't dump it. Yes, sir. Many candidates begin to suffer unable to cope with the sheer physical demands of the punishing pace and the extreme conditions. Some retire through injury, many are failed, some just give up or jack, unable to carry on. In the US Navy SEALs, the men spend hundreds of grueling hours on what is considered to be the most daunting obstacle course in the world. Over 50% of the candidates will ring the bell or quit before selection is completed. When you start the day's tab, no one tells you the distance that you're going to travel for that day or the cutoff time. 
all you know is your next checkpoint. Because what they want you to do is move as quickly as possible over those hills with the weight on your back. That not only tests to see if you've got the physical stamina to do that, but also the mental stamina, because you've got to do it day after day. And at this stage, they don't even want to know your name. To them, you're just a number. The best thing is just to be the grey man, keeping your head down and making sure your timings are good. And don't do anything that's going to draw attention to yourself. You don't want no yapping or mouthing off. Just get your head down and get on with the job. During SAS selection, the numbers grow smaller. The instructors begin to watch for character and temperament. There is no room for prima donnas. The best way to get through selection is not to stand out. I really hated the Elam Valley, especially in the winter during my selection. Um, visibility was bad because of the, the, the snow or the rain, which made navigating really hard. And also the covering of snow made it difficult to make distance. And on top of that, there's always the possibility of, of getting an injury. And it doesn't matter how fit you are for this first part of selection. If you get an injury, that'll slow you down and you'll be off. The South African SAS comprises of three squadrons and trains along the same lines as the UK's Special Air Service. Whilst the emphasis is on fighting and operations in the bush, the South African SAS plays a similar role to that of the SAS in Northern Ireland, particularly in information gathering and covert surveillance, and are deadly exponents in the art of bush warfare. Only the utterly dedicated will make it through to the fourth week. And for these people, Failure is particularly bitter. I was binned on my first selection just two days before the end. And I can remember sitting in Hereford Station with another binned soldier, and both of us were feeling absolutely devastated. What really got to me was the thought of all that training, and then once on selection, the physical and mental pain that I had to go through, plus the sheer exhaustion, only to fail on the last hurdle. And the other soldier had already used up his two chances and he started to cry on the way back because it was so devastating. Right then fellas, let's have the first guy. Remember lads, 60 pounds to gain your Bergen. If you haven't got 60 pounds when you get to the checkpoint and one of the DS is like to, uh, to wear your Bergen, you'll end up with another brick put in and you'll go to about 80 pounds. All right, so be aware of it. Any questions? At this stage of selection, the Bergen is packed with extra water and rations in preparation for longer taps and now weighs a crippling 60 pounds. The rigor of heavy load training is not some form of outmoded military torture designed just to weed out the weak. In the theater of war, these men will be expected to carry crippling loads of kit and equipment. During the Gulf War, Special Forces soldiers, inserted behind enemy lines, tabbed hundreds of kilometers with loads in excess of 200 pounds. During selection, there is no make weight in the Bergen, only what is actually needed for operations in hill country, such as food, water, sleeping bag, extra clothing and cooking kit. But the men need to train to carry heavy loads. On a covert mission, the Bergen will contain all the additional equipment needed for operations behind enemy lines. The last exercise, Sketch Map, is an awesome 22-mile tab finishing mid-afternoon. A mere seven hours later, the candidates set out on Endurance, the final and most formidable of the tests. It is all cross-country and mostly in darkness. Due to the distance and time, the Bergen is packed with extra water and rations. This extra weight begins to take its toll. At first, restricting the circulation across the neck and shoulders, new welts begin to form beneath the red, raw skin. The candidate has to bury the pain, keep moving, fix his mind on the objective, and just keep going. They tab all night, 
All the next day and late into the evening. In winter, 19 to 21 hours is considered a good time, and in summer, 16 to 17 hours. By now your body is wrecked, you're just knackered. If you're lucky, you've got no blisters, but what you will have are cramps, aches and pains, and maybe some ankle injuries. Now, these are a problem because it's gonna slow you down during this last tap. So what a lot of us were taking was a drug called Brufen, which controlled the pain and brought down the swelling a bit. But it doesn't really matter what injuries you had, nothing's gonna really stop you from doing this last tab. Short of breaking your leg, that is, and they gotta drag you off the hills for that. So it's just down to getting that 60 pound on your back and going for it. And it's the first hour that is the worst because you're trying to get over that pain barrier. And it's very much like a marathon runner trying to get through the wall. And because the last tab you done was only seven or eight hours ago, you're just totally exhausted anyway. So you just lean into it and keep on going. And what I took with me was two pound of aniseed twists and about 15 Mars bars. And on my way around, I just kept on throwing them down my neck and just went for it. All those who complete the last phase of special forces selection, endurance, will be in a physical state of utter exhaustion. But for those that do make it, an intoxicating sense of joy and elation outweighs everything. They have made it this far, but still have a long way to go, for they know the first and biggest hurdle is behind them. But after a brief rest of just a few weeks, they must steel themselves for the next two daunting phases of selection, weapons and jungle training. Selection concentrates heavily on fitness, stamina and determination, because without these basic, fundamental qualities, no one will get anywhere in special forces. Standards are particularly exacting. In the SAS, only around 10% of the intake survive the first month. Those that do qualify for special forces don't necessarily look like professional athletes or muscle men. But different special forces look for different candidates. Delta Force troops tend to be visibly muscular. Spetsnats more athletic. The Foreign Legion concentrate on stamina and the South African special forces on weapons and military abilities. Physique itself isn't important. Everybody thinks in special forces is that you've got to be six foot six tall, four foot wide to do the job. That isn't so. During the golf, we were carrying loads in excess of 15 stone each. It isn't what you look like, it's if you can do the job. That's what counts. But if you are six foot six, you stand out. Special forces don't want that. What they want is the grey man, somebody who can blend in. It is possible that some of the men may go straight into operational duties on joining their squadrons. So continuation begins with a period of intensive weapons training, with particular emphasis on the weapons most favored by special forces units. Because of their usefulness in covert operations and anti-terrorist work, pistols are an essential tool of all special forces. They are not only rigorously taught handgun drills, stance, shoot positions and stoppages, but are made to feel as though the weapon is a natural extension of their body. A fully trained Special Forces soldier can accurately fire 15 rounds in under three seconds and change a mag in under two seconds. They are taught the double tap, two shots fired in quick succession. This is standard CQB, close quarter battle training for anti-terrorist work. The double tap was devised to neutralize the threat, making double sure of the kill. The ability to shoot accurately is vital, and in all special forces, firing range work is intensive. All special forces require an advanced level of all-round weapons proficiency, not just with pistols and semi-automatic weapons, but with all the weapons used by special forces units. These include rifles, mortars, anti-tank weapons, machine guns, and many specialist weapons. There are many situations, however, in which the preferred weaponry may simply not be available. Accordingly, 
special forces are routinely trained in the use of a wide range of other firearms. In America's Green Berets, a weapons specialist must be able to fire and strip any of 80 foreign weapons in the dark. One of the most commonly encountered weapons is the infamous Kalashnikov AK-47, of which there are well over 100 million in circulation worldwide. Ironically, although enormous effort is devoted to weapons training, in much of their work, special forces prefer to only use this lethal expertise as a last possible resort, preferring to capture the enemy rather than inflict needless bloodshed. During a conflict, special forces are typically used for covert operations such as reconnaissance or sabotage. Once on the ground, special forces are highly trained in establishing covert OPs, observation posts or hides. The OP should command an excellent field of view, with a concealed exit and entry, and be highly camouflaged, allowing the unit to observe unseen. Should the OP be compromised by the enemy, the unit must neutralize the threat and exit the hide, or bug out. Relying on a preset compromise procedure, they'll use a TACB emergency beacon to call in an airlift. Killing has never been the primary role of special forces. If the idea was to simply kill people, you could get the artillery to do that. I have saturation bombing. And that's going to be far more effective than just having small groups of men armed with only what they can carry. What special forces are about is covert operations. Getting behind the lines, destroying the enemy's communications, their equipment and their supply lines. When you're doing that, you're also lowering their morale. And certainly during the Gulf War, the regiment were employed on them tasks well before hostilities started. Most special forces units contain an anti-terrorist team devoted to hostage and rescue operations. In any hostage-held situation, synchronized multiple entry throughout a building is essential. The team's assault with smoke and gas will deliberately help to create panic and confusion, making it easier to neutralize the target with less risk to the hostages. Once inside, each team member will clear specific parts of the building using CS gas and stun grenades to momentarily disorientate the terrorists, allowing them the vital seconds to make the kill. The well-drilled movement and precise communications between the team is essential when split-second reactions are needed. The stun grenades were first used to devastating effect during the Mogadishu hijack of October 77. The German crack commando unit, GSG-9, aided by two SAS men, used the newly developed stun grenades in an audacious attack. The whole operation took less than 11 seconds as they stormed the plane, killing all but one of the terrorists and freeing all the hostages unharmed. Even in a hostage situation, special forces always see an armed assault as emphatically the last option. A negotiated surrender with no fatalities is far preferable. But if the murder of hostages is plainly imminent, or has already begun, there may be no choice. In this case, the special forces will opt to go in with the brief to rescue the hostages at all costs. The unit will have planned the operation meticulously, studied plans of the building, located all points of entry and access, and assessing the best plan of attack. The success of any building assault is based on speed, surprise, and multiple entry. The Special Forces team will aim for the head using their double tap training. Anything else would be a risk to the hostages. Their captors will generally be in a nervous and excitable state, possibly equipped with guns and bombs which they will probably use as soon as they realize they're under attack. If they're given time to react, the consequences could be fatal. The only time you're going to point a weapon is if you're going to use it. And when we do kill people, we do it as quickly and as professionally as possible. First of all, that lowers the threat to you and the group that you're with. Because obviously a wounded man can still fire back. But also, why make it worse for the player? Just get it over and done with, because it's not a pleasant experience. It's 
just not like the films. And yes, we do get scared, but what we do know is that fear is a good, healthy, natural reaction. And if you're saying you're not scared, you're either a liar or you're mentally deficient, and you shouldn't be in this business anyway. That said, no one would hesitate to kill. Killing is taken seriously. We understand that the players that we could be up against have families and have friends, just the same as us. But we have a responsibility, first of all, to ourselves to keep us alive, and a responsibility to the rest of the patrol that you're with. And sometimes that means killing them first. And that's just a fact of life. If people think that killing is glamorous, well, basically, they must be sick in the head. If you've ever been in special forces, chances are you've had friends who have been seriously wounded or dropped. And it's not fun. It's not fun trying to keep somebody alive who've had their leg blown off by a landmine. And even David Sterling, the founder of our regiment during the Second World War, regretted killing a group of Germans with a hand grenade because he said it was unnecessary and it was just a waste of life to achieve the aim. And that ethos still survives now in a regiment. After weapons training, the next major phase in Special Forces continuation is jungle training, where the men spend a month deep in the tropical rainforest, learning the rudiments of living and fighting in the jungle. On arrival at the camp, the men immediately appreciate the need for supreme fitness. To even stand still in the intense heat and humidity is tiring. The environment is harsh and imposing, where innumerable diseases from insect or animal bite can flourish. Initial days in the thick, dense bush can be disorientating and frightening, with incessant sounds and movements, an environment with countless hidden dangers offering any potential enemy abundant cover and the element of surprise. The first thing the men must learn is how to construct an A-frame, which will provide them with a safe place to sleep off the jungle floor. In some armies, they think it's hard to sleep out on the jungle floor night after night. Of course, we practice it because sometimes we might have to. But the problem is the ground is sodden, it's damp, it's crawling with insects, there's snakes, scorpions. And if you're out in it, night after night, getting bitten to death by these things, it's naturally going to have an effect on your operational capability. And the fact is, you're not in the jungle to prove how hard you are. You're in the jungle because you've got a job to do. Although it's possible to live off insects and raw snakes, it's pointless doing so if something more palatable and nutritious is available. But as part of their training, the men are taught to forage and live off any nutritious things they can find such as roots and plants. The Australian SAS are trained in exactly the same way as the UK's SAS, divided into four squadrons, although greater emphasis is put on jungle combat. The Australian SAS have fought in many campaigns and during the Vietnam War mounted many daring covert missions, killing more than 500 Viet Cong guerrillas for the loss of only one man. The Australian regiment collectively won four Victoria Crosses in the Vietnam conflict. Day-to-day -day existence is full of discomforts. Although the mosquito repellent is strong enough to corrode plastic, it provides only partial immunity from the inevitable bites. Leeches can find their way to any part of the body. They secrete chemicals which allow them to feed without the victim's knowledge. But as soon as the leech drops off, bloated, the wound becomes inflamed and agonizingly painful. I was in a jungle in Southeast Asia once, and uh, a leech worked its way between my legs and latched onto a, quite a sensitive part of my body. Um, when I leapt up and pulled my trousers down, I nearly went into shock to see what it was doing. And it left me with this scar, and it's about the size of a cigarette burn, um, which is fine, I can live with that. The thing I couldn't live with for weeks afterwards was the rest of the squadron telling me that the leech was bigger than what it was dining on. But the real danger in the jungle is the jungle itself. Here, the basic rules for survival are imperative. The men are taken through every aspect of jungle survival. Within the dense forest, it is all too easy to become hopelessly disorientated and become lost just a few yards from the camp. The instructors instill the importance to go everywhere, even the shortest distance, in pairs. The men soon discover any physical exertion is debilitating and makes it even more difficult for the body to maintain its proper temperature. 
sweat does not evaporate, stimulating the body to produce even more. Any lost bodily fluids must be steadily replaced, or dehydration and blackouts will ensue. Once you start doing operations in the jungle, it's very easy to forget that you've got to take a lot of fluid on board to stop you dehydrating. And it happened to me once. I just collapsed, my hands started to shake, uh, I had a cold sweat, and I couldn't even undo my belt kit. Uh, the whole patrol had to stop and get lots of fluids and electrolyte down me to, to get me to recover. The basic belt kit, which includes water bottles, sterilizing tablets, map, compass and ammunition, is carried at all times. As the means for obtaining shelter and food, the galak or machete is the soldier's single most vital piece of equipment. A large part of the time is spent on practical training and exercises, the preparing of ambushes and the rudiments of camouflage. For jungle work, camouflage cream goes over the mosquito repellent and weapons are carried at all times, the most favored being the M16-203, proving its extreme proficiency in the jungle war of Vietnam and has been adopted as the preferred weapon of Western Special Forces. The men first learn how to use explosives to clear a landing site or winch hole for a helicopter. If there is any medical emergency or a military need to get out quickly, a helicopter is the only means of getting a casualty out swiftly. On covert missions, the men are trained to operate without spoken orders, using only hand signals to communicate. Four men are recognized as being the ideal tactical number to maximize the chance of surprise and minimize the chance of compromise. Each patrol member will be cross-trained, so each man is a specialist in at least one of the patrol skills. A unit would usually consist of a signaler, a medic, a demolitions expert, and at least one man proficient in languages. A patrol must leave no signs which could alert the enemy to its presence. Even cobwebs must be left intact. Bodily waste must be collected. Because of the insect life it attracts, it makes a conspicuous marker. The men take it in turns to lead the patrol, helping to develop leadership qualities and an appreciation of the problems leadership brings. Nearly always it is better to make a wrong decision and act promptly on it rather than to be indecisive. And the best way to illustrate this is to describe a picture that's hanging on our training wing wall in Hereford. It's a pen and it's full of sheep and underneath it says you've got to do one of three things. Lead, follow or get out of the way. The jungle navigation phase more than anywhere else is where everybody starts to get on each other's nerves. Maybe the patrol commander has taken the wrong route, and that obviously makes it a lot harder for the rest of the patrol. But that is precisely what the DS want, because they're looking to see if you've got the aptitude and the temperament to work in a harsh environment, under extreme pressure, and just with a small group. And the jungle certainly provides that environment. Jungle navigation demands skill and experience. The maps show little more than contours and rivers, the men are taught never to use the high ground or tracks, but to cross grain and move in the thick foliage of the low ground, where the enemy and even animals will not travel, stopping only to check their position and to send out occasional navigation patrols. If the patrol commander gets it wrong, it can sometimes mean a day's distance lost. After several exhausting days in the jungle, tempers can begin to fray. When moving through jungle, a lead scout goes on ahead, weapon at the ready to check the route is safe. A camouflaged and motionless enemy will only be spotted if everyone's eyes and mind are thoroughly attuned to the environment. Combat in the harsh, dense foliage of the jungle can be daunting and exacting. Nowhere else creates the same disorientation and confusion with the enemy often unseen. The men have meticulously practiced jungle combat. They're taught how to set and spring an ambush on an unsuspecting enemy camp. For each type of enemy encounter, 
they're taught specific contact drills, but the intense training and drills prepare the men for a real combat encounter. Live ammunition is nearly always used. In the regular army, this would be thought too dangerous, but in special forces, given the small numbers and quality of the trainees, the risks are considered acceptable. It's always a dilemma. The more realistic the training, the more dangerous it is. However, training must be as realistic as possible because firing live ammunition certainly hones the senses and more importantly, it prepares you for the real thing. And yes, we have had people shot and killed, but we need to train to a high standard. Therefore, we think the risk is necessary. Nowhere was the lack of jungle training more relevant than in Vietnam. The Green Berets Special Forces Group learned the hard way. Caught in a jungle war they were ill-prepared for, they adopted the skills and techniques of the Viet Cong, becoming themselves experts in jungle warfare. The valuable lessons learned in jungle combat, patrolling and survival skills have been passed on to other special forces, leading to the exacting jungle training courses now run by all special forces units. The constant pressure on the men is deliberately unremitting. When not on exercises in the jungle, the whole day is taken up with instruction, practice, debriefing, tests and study. And adding to the stress, the men know that throughout the four weeks, character and general aptitude are also being continuously assessed by their mentors. We were tested to the extremes, both physically and mentally, because the DS wanted to see if we could make special air service troopers, because it was their decision whether we'll go to the squadrons or not. And personally myself, I found it the hardest thing I've ever done. During the month of the jungle phase, I lost about a stone in weight. And in fact, I found it a lot harder than test week, where at least there you could put the burden on your back and just cover the distance. And to a certain extent, you can switch off. But here in the jungle, it was just as physical, but that you were put under an immense mental pressure at the same time. They were constantly filling you with information and expecting you to take it in and then act on that information. And if they told you something once, they would expect you to remember it. The whole of the jungle phase culminates in a week-long exercise where everything that you've been taught is tested. That's patrolling, navigation, ambushes, escape and evasion, and all the survival skills that you've been taught over those last three weeks. At the start of selection, there was 180 of us. By the time we went to the jungle, there was 24 left. And after the jungle, we found out that only eight of us got through. And the system that the training team used to decide if you're in or you're out, is asking ourselves the simple question, would you have this man in your patrol? And if the majority of them say no, well, that's it, you've been. If the majority say yes, you've passed that phase. And they take this task very seriously because one day you might be on their patrol on an operation. In between the main phases of Special Forces continuation, the men attend a number of smaller courses. All are important and some are vital. They include general field medicine and trauma management, signals, spotting for artillery, demolition, sniping, and covert sabotage work. In most special forces units, the final part of their intensive training covers the four essentials of escape, evasion, survival, and interrogation. It begins with instruction on how to stay alive in the open navigating from the sun, constructing and lighting a fire. Finding and gathering water and foraging for food. The men are taught to construct snares and traps. The men are also taught how to build a temporary or semi-permanent shelter known as a basher. This was the last major phase of continuation training and potentially the most scary because the Special Air Service were not responsible for part of this training. It was an external agency called the Joint Service Interrogation Wing. They're the people who would say you had passed or failed. So what I decided to do was to do the minimum requirement to pass and that was it. During the escape and evasion phase of combat survival uh, you're given a British Army Second World War battle dress and greatcoat to wear. And if there's any suspicion that you're hiding food or any extra bits of escape kit, 
the DSO come along and they'll just start cutting it up and looking inside the battle dress. And that's counterproductive because that means then you go out into the field already ripped to shreds. Okay, fellas. What basically happens is that you're let loose with an escape map. And that's basically a sketch map that you've drawn on a piece of parachute silk. And what the DS give you is a location where you can meet an agent. And that agent will then tell you where to go to the next agent. Sometimes they'll give you food, sometimes they won't. It could be a potato, it could be a couple of slices of bread. Compared to the jungle phase, the early part of combat survival is almost a holiday. But the concluding major exercise is as daunting as any already faced. For five days, the men are on the run, having to survive in the open with nothing but the basic survival kit. Moving along a succession of rendezvous points, whilst being hunted by detachments of regular troops driven on by the incentive of extra leave for every fugitive they catch. Such exercises are universally practiced. The Green Berets are dropped in the middle of a national forest and have to make at least 25 miles whilst being pursued by tracker dogs and the 82nd Airborne. During the day, finding the most prickliest antisocial bush you can find and getting in there to avoid them. The men are taught the basic art of camouflage and concealment using any natural cover or terrain to try to cover their tracks and movement from the hunter force. As in jungle training, they will move through thick bush, hoping the hunter force will stick to the path. As soon as the hunter force know that you're in the area, it's very unlikely that you're going to get away. They've got aircraft, they've got dogs, they've got men on the ground. The men are generally set off in pairs and will try to move quietly and tactically stopping only to rest or to do a navigation check. The hunter force will have mobilized several squads to hunt down the runners. They will be aware of the possible route the runners may take and fan out. Each runner will have a survival tin with everything he needs to stay alive in the open, containing a button compass, a flint and steel fire lighter, a commando wire saw, fish hooks and line, snare wire, oxo cubes, and needles and thread. The escape and evasion phase of the Special Forces selection is designed to test the men to the utmost, to run them into the ground, to try to break their spirits, reduce them to a physical state of exhaustion. Again, this is to mirror the possibility of being hunted down and captured in a real combat situation. Once the hunter force has picked up their trail, there is little real chance of escape. The runners, in a tired and weakened state, will try a last desperate attempt to make a run for it, but physically exhausted from lack of food and sleep, their capture is inevitable. Whilst in this weakened condition, they are suddenly called upon to face a new and grimmer ordeal. During the Gulf War, several Special Forces soldiers had to face the daunting and horrific ordeal of capture, incarceration and torture. All prone to capture troops go through the interrogation training, designed to mirror, as much as possible, the stress, fear and mental abuse they may have to face at the hands of their captors. But no one can really prepare a soldier for the physical abuse and torture they will certainly have to endure. To survive this ordeal, the individual soldier must draw on his own inner reserve of strength and courage and must surely rank as a true ultimate warrior. Being captured as a prisoner of war must rank as one of the most frightening experiences a soldier can face. The immediate fear of the unknown, the fear of a severe beating or death. Interrogation is brutal, both physically and mentally. And what I soon discovered was that I had to accept that they had physical control over me. There's nothing I could do about that. But what they wanted control of was this. So what I'd done was directed all my efforts to keeping my mind complete, keeping mental integrity. And the way I'd done that was to just keep focused, first of all, on just giving the big four the number, rank, name, date of birth. They have no idea how long the painful wait may be 
or what will happen to them next. Interrogation is physically and mentally demanding. For the prone to capture troops, such as special forces, they have been trained for the real possibility of capture and interrogation. During the course, we had lectures from many ex-prisoners of war, from the Second World War, Korean and Vietnam conflict. And the one that really stuck in my mind was a United States pilot who got shot down over North Vietnam and was put in solitary confinement for six years. And during this time, he went for horrendous torture. Every major bone in his body was broken. But he was still alive, because I was, I was watching him. He was there giving his talk. He had no hair, he had no teeth, he had no muscle mass, but he was still alive. And when I became a prisoner during the Gulf War, I used to think back to that lecture. And it really helped me during the time of my torture, because I knew that there'd been people who'd gone through a lot more than me, and they were still alive. And that helped me very much indeed. There was beatings, there was torture, both at the point of capture and in the interrogation centre in Baghdad. But from that point of capture, what I wanted to be was the grey man. I didn't want to get picked out for special treatment. I didn't want to be something different. So what I'd done, and the other members of the patrol that were caught, was just to give the big four number, rank, name, date of birth. But we knew later on that wasn't going to be enough. So as a patrol, we decided to have a cover story. And this was to prove later to be invaluable because it, in fact, it saved our lives. During the interrogation process, people find out a lot about their individual strengths and weaknesses. The interrogators are probing the entire time looking to break the prisoner. The techniques a prisoner can use are limited but worthwhile. He should try to give the impression of being more stupid and more exhausted and confused than he really is. Underneath, however, he must remain as clear-headed as he can and be alert to his interrogator's tactics. Legally, prisoners of war are bound only to give their name, number, rank and date of birth. But the captured Special Forces soldiers of the Gulf soon realized this would not be enough to keep them alive. I knew that the Big Four would only last for a short while. After going through relentless questioning, um, beatings, kick-ins, getting paraded through the town so the local population could take the frustrations out of, on you, I knew it wouldn't be long before I was dead. So then was the time to break into my cover story, as other members of the patrol did also. What that done, that gave us more time. But the problem was, is that that was the story we'd have to stick to. And the cover story was that we were members of a search and rescue team. These are groups of people that would go in to occupy territory to extract shot down pilots. What I went through during combat survival and interrogation training at Hereford really helped me during my time as a prisoner of war in the Gulf. Not only did it let me know what physically I was to expect once I got into an interrogation centre, more importantly for me, it helped me focus my mind so I could get through this ordeal. With the gruelling and exhaustive initial training behind him, the individual Special Forces soldier will return to his unit to be officially batched. Some are grand public affairs, most are low-key and informal. The US Navy SEALs turn out in their ceremonial whites and invite friends and family. Each man steps forward to receive his acceptance from the commanding officer. The SAS has no ceremony. Each man is ushered into the presence of the commanding officer, who simply hands him a sand-colored beret from the pile on his desk. There are no handshakes. Usually, he tells him, just remember, it's harder to keep than to get. For me, being badged in 22 Special Air Service Regiment was the most fantastic feeling of achievement I've ever had in my life. Just standing there waiting to, to get my berry and thinking that there was only one of eight out of 180 who passed the most arduous selection process in the world made me, made me feel pretty wonderful. And I bet you there's not one single Special Forces soldier anywhere in the world from whatever unit who cannot remember the day he got accepted into that unit, the one that he's trained so hard for. 
But these men are not just gaining acceptance into a crack elite unit. They are becoming a member of a worldwide fraternity of highly trained men ready to take on the ferocity of war. From sieges to hijacks, from warfare to the hearts and minds policy, providing aid and medical assistance to war-torn countries. Many people owe their lives to the courageous tenacity of the world's special forces units. These men have entered the hallowed ranks of the ultimate warrior. Gulf War, 1991. Allied aircraft take off on a mission to destroy a group of 29 Iraqi Scud missiles. The elusive and easily transportable Scuds have been located and pinpointed by a joint group of the British and US Special Forces units. You've seen a little of what Special Forces have achieved in the past. In the rest of the program, we're going to explore what goes in the making of today's Special Forces soldier. We'll see how the recruitment and selection process works and what the initial training involves. But above all, we'll be asking what makes a Special Forces soldier? What motivates him? Why does he risk his life? Because at the end of the day, Special Forces will always be involved in a conflict. Therefore, the risk of him losing his life is far greater. What motivates him to do that? If you pass selection and become a Special Forces soldier, there's a wide range of skills that you'll then be expected to master. And these fall into two groups, an infiltration skill and a patrol skill. Infiltration skills are there so that you can covertly make entry into enemy territory, whatever the terrain. This could be by parachute, by sea or by land. Then once you're there, you'll start to employ patrol skills. And these could be things like a demolitions expert, a signaller, a medic or even a linguist, so you at least you can speak the language of the territory you're operating in. A member of a special forces unit will be expected to learn and master all aspects of parachuting, from static line, where the chute is automatically deployed on exit from the aircraft, to the highly specialized halo and hey-ho parachuting. The technique of hey-ho, high altitude, high opening parachuting, allows the Special Forces soldier to exit the aircraft in unoccupied territory and drift deep behind enemy lines. These parachutists may take as long as an hour to fall to earth. During that time, they will travel and maneuver up to 80 kilometers, carrying a full ground operation This man has a long way to go. Whether he makes it depends entirely on his own stamina and determination. For he's free to quit at any time. Already he is cruelly punishing his body. His feet are throbbing and blistered, his ankles swelling. His shoulder muscles are aching from the heavily laden burden he carries on his back. His immediate objective is still some 25 kilometers away. But that's only for today. Tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after that, he will force himself further, meeting the harsher ordeals expected. He'll be tested to the utmost limits of his endurance, and possibly beyond. The schedule is as arduous as that of any aspiring Olympic athlete. But this man is competing only against himself. He wants to prove that he possesses a specific and very rare blend of exceptional physical and mental qualities. By doing so, he'll take the first step towards realizing what is a dominating, all-consuming ambition. His goal, eventually, is to gain admission to the ranks of the most revered military unit, to serve in the ranks of what are most commonly referred to as special forces.
Throughout the armies of the world, there has emerged a new breed of courageous men. Men willing to risk and lay down their lives, often in perilous covert missions deep behind enemy lines. Highly trained and obsessively focused, they are the crack troops of the world's elite special forces. Since World War II, this new breed of elite soldiers has emerged. No longer ad hoc groups mounting hit and run raids on enemy targets, but a highly organized, highly trained, intensely self disciplined, and ruthless band of men who make up the individual elite forces of the world's armies. The SAS, USA's Delta Force, Germany's GSG 9, the French Foreign Legion, Russia's Spetsnaz and the US Navy SEALs are just a few of the many special forces units. All have a grueling and exacting selection process. Only the truly elite make the grade. Once selected, they undergo an intense and physically demanding training process to an impossibly high standard, finally going on to become highly trained fighting machines with the emphasis on stamina, mental focus and imagination. But above all, the will to survive, making them the true, ultimate warriors. Hello, my name's Andy McNabb. I served in the British Army for 18 years. Ten of those years were with 22 SAS, the Special Air Service. And what I want to do during this, this program is to relate some of my experiences with you. The first thing I want to say is that nobody gets into any Special Forces unless they give 100%. That's both physically and mentally. Because once you get in, there's no excuse for anything else. Because what they'll demand from you always is 100%. To get into the Special Air Service, or what we call a regiment, takes a high degree of stamina. Now that's both physical and mental. But it doesn't stop there, because once you get into your squadron, that fitness has to be maintained. And there's no fitness tests once you're there. It's all down to self-discipline. But the day you can't fulfill your task, because you're not fit enough, then that's time to leave. And even at this early stage in my selection, I felt this uh, affinity to special forces and felt part of the family. But still, I had six months to go. A number of countries maintain special forces units. The variations make a compact definition impossible, but they all have some common features. Invariably, the units are manned by volunteers only. Entry into these elite forces is exacting and difficult. The training is specialized, intensive, and wide-ranging. The units are small and prefer a high degree of anonymity, as the work is often covert and decided at the highest government level. Sometimes, inevitably, particular operations attract world headlines, but for the individual soldiers, only a strict, anonymous fame is tolerated since neither their true names or their identity can be made public. The pay is not extravagant. The time spent away from friends and loved ones invariably long. Anyone joining special forces can expect neither wealth nor glory. Theirs is a different motivation, one of self-belief. How far they can push their own limits, with the inner satisfaction of belonging to a small group of highly skilled and motivated professionals with the chance of carrying out tasks few would even venture to undertake. Special forces can be traced back even to Roman times, but they only started to appear as we know it during the Second World War. And this was partly due to new military technology, and in particular aviation, because it was now possible to get small groups of men, transport them over into enemy territory to create havoc and bring them back again. So what was needed was men capable of doing that, taking advantage of this technology. Because the whole concept of special forces is to create the maximum damage with a minimum risk. Burma, 1943. The Chinditz, brainchild of the eccentric but charismatic Ord Windgate, mounted their first daring raid into occupied Burma, providing a desperately needed gleam of success in a theater hitherto dogged by defeat. The Chinditz blossomed under the joint sponsorship of Churchill and the Americans into a core sized special forces unit. North Africa, 1942. A detachment of David Sterling's newly formed SAS, the Special Air Service, 
sets out across the desert on a daring raid which takes them hundreds of miles deep behind enemy lines. In under two years, Sterling's men will destroy hundreds of fuel dumps, vehicles, and some 300 Luftwaffe aircraft, the equivalent of a modest air force. The Pacific, 1942. Responding to a radioed warning from an Australian coast watcher living undercover amidst the enemy, American naval aircraft repel a major Japanese strike against the fragile yet vital bridgehead on Guadalcanal. Gran Sasso, Italy, 1943. In a spectacular rescue mission, a German unit led by Otto Scorzeni snatches the captive Mussolini from his mountaintop prison. Malaya, 1951. An SAS troop treks into the jungle for a week-long reconnaissance mission. Such missions are crucial to what will prove to be one of the most successful counterinsurgency wars ever mounted. Vietnam, 1964. U.S. Green Berets, living and working with the native Vietnamese, encourage and train the villagers to defend themselves against the Viet Cong. This Hearts and Minds campaign achieves outstanding success, but is cancelled before coming to full fruition. Uganda, 1976. After an airliner flying from Tel Aviv is hijacked and forced to land at Entebbe Airport, the paratroopers of Israel's Special Unit 269 are mobilized. In an audacious surprise assault, they seize the airport and safely rescue all but three of the 258 hostages. The Falklands, 1982. As the British prepare for the recapture of the Argentinian-occupied islands, both the SAS and the SBS are already ashore on both the Falkland Islands and mainland Argentina, transmitting back invaluable information about the Argentinian strength and positions. The 